Finals Action Bonanza in the LCK and LCS. A pair of teams looking to three-peat on the day. We know the Gen G versus T1 rivalry. It's always it's the best in the world right now. You're always guaranteed a certified at least four or five games set in this finals. T1 has all the momentum in the world, even though they lost to Genji in the winner's final. And then we get there, top to bottom, from draft to macro, T1 absolutely outclassed across the board. Somebody messed up in Gen G and they made the dinner reservation two, three hours early. And they said, okay, boys, take care of business. Clean it up. Let's get out of well, here. We are not Real. eating tonight. They played like they wanted to eat tonight and they were eating up the T1 players out there on the rift. What a great series from Gen G. I think you look at all five roles and obviously there are certain players that you want to dive into a little bit more about how their performance went. They're making a big gap between them and the other members of T1 who certainly, I don't think, played poorly in this series. Just simply the level that Gen G was at, the way that they were able to step right in, whether it was going to be KT or T1 on that day, and what their effort was on the Rift, undeniable that they would be claiming that 3P championship. And listen, game three, absolutely. There's pushback, far and away the most competitive game of the series but going forward to worlds now the number one strategy for any team against gen g ban recon that's it because delight in both his recon games in this series was an absolute master class and we already saw it in the last series we were highlighting him have some insane alistair performances maybe most surprisingly is how much on this star studded gen g roster we're talking about delight popping off it's one of the greatest stories about this Gen G roster. Again, a Gen G that is back to back to back champions in the LCK. You know, losing Ruler and making the changes that you had to make this year. I think a lot of people looked at it and what they were going to do. And there were still questions about whether you were, you know, doing the right thing, betting on yourself, betting on your development system, promoting pays into that spot with Ruler, but then putting alongside him Delight coming over from Freddie Brion. Not a lot of people would have said that's the move. That's the type of team moving a player from there that I want at the very top of the LCK. And Delight delivers a masterclass. Really, the disruptor throughout this series, that Rakan, you got to get it out of there if you're the enemy team. And pays, obviously, 100% LCK title win rate in his first year. And I know people are saying, how you keep letting this guy Zeri? And... Just like Ruler, we used to say, yeah, sure, you spent Zeri, Aphelio, Saya, Kaisa, Nyla, apparently. It does this guy is the furthest thing from a one trick. It's the scariest thing because again, you think back to that T1 Gen G series that we had about a week ago, and you're going, How do you let this guy get that Aphelios in game five? The one where he's gonna dominate red and white guns, do not fight, all these things. And then you head into this series, and it's the Zeri going, picking up the 12 kills, deathless, first games. And then you, you know, stroll into lane, game three, with that Nyla. And again, we have looked at and we have talked about Nyla and what she has, you know, what type of impact she has at the professional level. And it has varied. We've seen a couple little, you know, pocket picks here or there in the, in the LPL where it has found a little bit of pop-off. Nothing, I think, like this, where it was so clearly a member that was going to work off and provide that 200 years of riot design and disgustingness in the favor of Gen G. Peanut also in owner's head throughout this entire series. The tank meta, he is thriving in the jungle, and you can't talk about a finals without talking about Chobi, Silas, Talia, and top laners take note because that was the cleanest Cassante performance we've maybe seen all year, at least all split. Oh my god, I mean, and talk about that Talia and, and that Cassante combined for me. I mean, the Silas was okay, but those two picks and some of these key moments in the team fights where he is absolutely finding those big plays for this Gen G squad. There's a couple of them, even with the disadvantages, even with the advantages on the side of Gen G, you're looking at what he's doing to make that disruption against T1 to get into that back line. Chovy was fantastic throughout this series, handling things, of course, in that mid lane. I think you could look at it and say maybe either between him, uh, you know, you're, you're looking over at Peanut as well and everybody else, but certainly Gen G is not the only team that has failed at this. To sometimes lock down those kills on Faker still seems to have 
those magic shoes where he always gets out of every single thing. Can't get out of this series as it ends for Gen G taking that win. And I think it was in the ahead of the finals last year. Chovy said, winning finals is great. Beating T1 in finals always feels better. And that's now six straight finals. T1 has fallen in. This star-studded roster hasn't won anything since 2022 spring. They even alluded to it when you were, you know, when we had a little bit of the trash talk segment before this finals got going. And I mean, trash talk segment, you definitely had, you could tell the respect between Faker and Chovy, recognizing that they are the two pinnacles of that mid lane power in the LCK. The only real thing Faker had against Chovy was, he was, was to say that, remember about three, four years ago when I denied you in playoffs and all these other times? Yeah, that's the last time that you were able to get the edge on Chovy. He has continued to level up. And now that he is leading the charge as that big face of Gen G, three championships looking pretty good for Mr. Chovy. The Chokey memes are long since gone and faded. Get him out of here. Faded away. But. Thankfully, T1 still booked their ticket to the World Championship as that second seed. And we got to, of course, highlight that Game 5 of the Telecom War because that is one of the nuttiest, not even just Game 5, standalone games we've had all year long. Three Baron Steals and an Elder Dragon Steal. That Game 5 was nutty. I think that's how Genji knew that they had to bring this type of game into the finals to squash T1 is they realized the script, the power writing, it's too strong for T1 if they're taking game fives against KT Rolster like this. The three Baron steals coming through, of course. The first one is still crazy. It's a game five. The second one comes through off of BDD's Vigar. Didn't have that one in the cards. And then Owner makes the return to steal back the Baron on that Nocturne. You had Guma making the crazy base defense against the Elder Dragon buff, and then making the aggressive play to still close things out 14-1 in that game five. Unforgettable, a fantastic series. I don't think it should be uh, looked at any real difference, even knowing the result of the final. Just please, KT, we know your history in the gauntlet, the regional finals. This team's too good not to go to the world championship. They got two opportunities to win a single best of five. Don't choke, please. Previous years, I'd be thinking yes about all the KT bad mojo and previous examples and everything else. And even after, yes, falling once again to T1 in that heartbreaking fashion in game five, I still have seen enough signs of this and enough resilience from this KT Rolster team that I have good faith they are going to be able to bounce back, reset mentally and approach into this gauntlet and show us exactly the KT that has been showing through this summer one that is of that world's quality. And what they did to teams like Hanwha Life and D+, Plus when they match up against them because they are clearly a cut above them. So excited to see Aiming and the boys bounce back in that gauntlet for KT Rolster. One three-peat happens. One three-peat is harshly denied with three straight wins. And Mark, if I told you the start in the preseason before summer, NRG, in their first year of the rebrand from CLG are not only going to win the split, but you're going to be talking about Ignar as a focal point for that. We talked about this bot lane changing, and I don't know if this is going to make the team any better. A few months later, here we are with all these guys, except for FBI, capturing their first LCS title. Uh, hey, man, that's a, that's a pie in our face. That's one that we got wrong for sure. But you know what? I will give us a little bit of defense. If you had told either one of us that we were gonna have Alistar and Rel be major players in the bot lane, I'd be more and more warm to adding Ignar to the squad and you saw that on full display this series. Yes, NRG with the truly counter logic result of pulling off the upset against Cloud9. Sell your team, win a championship. Easy peasy for NRG and I believe don't fully quote me on this, but this is the first time in a long time, if not ever, that we are rolling through with domestic solo lane champions for the LCS, rolling with Mr. Palafox in the mid lane and the big dokes up in the top side. And you're actually excited to see them both perform internationally, especially Pala Faker, because, I mean, across the board, you can talk about this NRG lineup. These are guys... 
having to prove people wrong, having redemption stories. Ignar, we talked about, most people talked about him being washed up coming into this year. Palafox is a guy who was perennially stuck in Academy, and you were saying, is he LCS starting caliber? Same goes for Dokla, same goes for contracts, and now here they are showing up on the final stage. You can say Cloud9 was maybe not up to their normal level, but there's no question that NRG played at the highest level that they've played all split long. Even FBI sets a finals record with 16 kills and maybe has his best three games back to back to back that he's had all year long. It's incredible. And I think a lot of people as well were, you know, we mentioned about Ignar in that bottom lane having those questions. Still people questioned about FBI joining this team and being that option in the bottom lane. I think a lot of people moving away from the hype and excitement that he was able to build with himself, early Golden Guardians, and then with 100 Thieves, a lot of people wanting out, not seeing him as one of these top options anymore in the LCS finals performance. Absolutely, emphatically says, yes, I am one of these top dogs in the LCS bottom lanes. You look at Contract's journey that he's had, I, you know, I'm not 100% sure on this one, but I think he's been to Worlds as that number one seed representative for the LCS before. Certainly a long gap. Between that time and the work that he has done down in the academy to get here, love that. And Big Dokes, remember those years where he was on Optic and you weren't really thrilled with his gameplay, but you knew that the way the team was lined up and what he was capable of, he has this power to carry things through and be that big top lane presence. He's now that big dog up in that top side for NRG. Now, obviously, you know, the game one loss pretty convincingly in the favor of Cloud9, and then three straight for NRG. They were close, they were back and forth, especially game four, when Jimenez is starting four and O oh on the Yone, you're expecting him to snowball this out, gets caught a few different times. But uh, if you are a fan of the LCS, this is an ideal scenario, I think, because you have Cloud9 kind of get a wake up call before Worlds and say, okay, we, we do have a lot of stuff we need to work on. It's not just coasting in before they get completely slammed internationally. And then on the other side, you have FBI, who I was looking for stepping up in the playoffs, no question. He did in this series against Berserker of all 80 carries. And Palafox continues to be, he was far and away the best mid laner this entire playoff run. I, I think it's extremely valuable for the LCS on both sides, both angles as you're talking about. One for that Cloud9, that wake up call, that realization that, you know what, we do need to sharpen things up. We do need to be better prepared, more adaptable on certain things, whatever. This exposure, this type of, you know, turmoil that you go through, through losing, can absolutely make you better, make it a harder, more tight knit group for this Cloud9 team heading towards an important international event. And on the NRG side, I think this is extremely valuable, not for the obvious reasons, but for the confidence that it's going to give this team. Because I think a lot of times, you know, LCS teams, and especially LCS teams that maybe aren't bringing this same hype and backing like Cloud9, TSMs of the past, Team Liquid, 100 Thieves, you might fall into this zone of, ah, oh, do we really belong? You know, we know we are such an underdog. And it plays into the fact of the underdog, not where it's the positive, that you believe, you know, anything's possible, might as well shoot for the stars type of thing. It's that underdog of, ah, well, we're not good enough. They're better than us. They'll beat us eventually type of thing. Getting a win like this, stepping up against a Cloud9 that was looking for that back-to-back -back -back championships, this is great for NRG to get a little bit of boost, a little bit of more belief in themselves and what they can get done at this top level. And they're 100% going to be getting a boost in fans for one winning this. And there's so many storylines and, and players to, you want to be behind guys like Contracts and Dokla and Palafox who are so excited about winning. This is, listen, as much as I love the guys on Cloud9, this is much more exciting for the league than Cloud9 winning another split, not being tested, seeing NRG show up. Now maybe you have two teams that you could be excited about you know, LCS levels of excited about when we go to international events. But great for the league overall. And yeah, NRG first split as this new organization and you win the whole thing. This new organization has got to be beyond thrilled. And by the way, how about seeing the coaching staff down there? You got Apollo, Demonte, Soaz, all these ex-LCS players helping out the squad. 
Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because that was the other aspect that I think a lot of people should be fans of, should love to see and have that feel good feeling. When you see NRG, doesn't matter. NA, LCS, LEC, EU, whatever your side is, you're looking at these guys, you're seeing some of these legends and realizing their contributions, their ties, they're still getting that enjoyment from the game and competing at that type of level. Really like to see this from NRG. I think this is overall feel good weekend for the LCS. And you know what? Those are kind of few and far between for us sometimes. And you even had, you know, Doklam and Palafox memeing a bit in the champion select. Afterwards, <laughs> the interviews, they were saying, yeah, we wanted everyone to think we don't play Jax. And then we pull it out in these finals and pop off because Dokla, for the most part, definitely was outclassing Fudge in this matchup. Oh, yes, sir. And you know what? The champion pool, the type of ways that he is playing... I ain't saying that Dokla is stacking up and, and bringing terror to the likes of Doran, 369, Bin, whatever your choice that we're going to be seeing at these world championships. But he's certainly showing for North America and a North America that hasn't been able to stack up or have that type of threat that he's going to be someone playing these champions in the way that he is playing it. You, you like to roll the dice on that one at the very least if you're an LCS fan. But if you're excited about Dokla's performance, then you can be... Whew, to the moon, excited about what Mr. Broken Blade was doing against Team BDS. Well, you know, X off the loss that G2 had in the series. If you look at the three <laughs> wins for G2, 14, 1, and 28 for BB, who over the months, years of this G2 roster has been looked at as the weak point. But as now they clinch their spot at Worlds, he's looking like one of the strongest points of this G2 squad. And if that is somewhere where G2 is getting a level up in their, you know, performance level and what is going on right now, be be afraid. Be afraid of this team because if you've got that as a solid option, as a, something that's not going to be where other teams are able to build up their own advantage or something to punch back in a later team fight, you've got the rest of G2. You got the rest of Yikes, Caps, Mr. Han, Sama, and Mickey putting it down out there on the rift. And we saw that in those three wins against BDS. You'd be excused if maybe you were a little distracted by what was going on with the cap sideshow of what he does with Nico. But other than that, <laughs> oh. there was a lot of good things to keep track of for this G2 team. And you were right. It starts with Broken Blade getting it done in that top side. And listen, we, we meme Caps all the time for whenever he plays Nico because I swear he's running around as a tiny Krug more than his actual champion. But... He was great in all his Nico performances in this series. He's racking up double digit kills and it finally pays off in game four because BDS and LeBrov think the big Raptor is Caps because he's in their heads. And he of course is not actually the Raptor to close things out. It's every it's everybody else that is playing the Nico is trying to go, okay, I'm trying to fool them so I can make this play, so I can get this thing to pop off. Watching Caps, it almost feels like Fooling the enemy team, just going under the radar incognito type of thing is good enough for him on this Nico. That's what he wants to keep testing out and trying out. Still effective, still pretty darn effective for this G2 team. And when Caps is having a little bit of fun, able to get that done and still looking crisp and clean in that mid lane. Again, Broken Blade starting well in that top side. Caps getting it done, having fun in the mid lane. On Sama bringing it up with the damage. It's a pretty good combination for G2 Esports. And I know people right away are comparing. We just watched the LCK final, and then you watch this series, and you're like, wow, the level is a huge drop off for the LEC. First off, it's been a couple weeks since anyone was on the Rift. This is the first round of playoffs. Things are warming up, and more so than any team, maybe worldwide, G2 is playing to the level of their opponent. If they're playing against a world-class team, you see them absolutely level up. If they want to get in the mud, get a little sloppy chaos-wise domestically, see him do that too and again look, there's other ways to talk about these matches and maybe go down that list and have that type of comparison and have those takeaways but for g2 and what you're doing i don't think anybody is losing that or had lost that faith that this is one of those teams that is going to provide that wrinkle provide that aspect provide that chance of these upsets when you are looking at that angle towards the lpl and lck and of course it is the upset even for a team like G2 at that type of point. What we saw this weekend, getting back into things, of course, with the long break between the ending of the summer split and getting to this point for the LEC, 
I think we can all be happy with what we saw from G2 if you're an LEC fan. And G2 clinching worlds is absolutely to the surprise of no one. Mad Lions 3-0-ing the uh, summer finalists from XL and leveling up after this three-week break. Well, that one wasn't on my bingo card. That one was not, but if you told me that Niski getting a Zier was going to be a pretty good thing for these Mad Lions, I think you could uh, put that one in the checkmark column pretty early for this squad. And hey, don't look now. El Yoya's Ivern. That is certainly one that I didn't think I'd be talking about before, <laughs> but it is making that difference out there on the rift for the Mad Lions. Yeah, Ivern seems a little bit busted right now. Some of that shielding and redemption is a little bit uh, nutty, okay. but Mad Lions, I mean... I'm going to say some of it is to do with the formatting here for a three-week break. They had plenty of opportunity. Excel loses maybe the momentum from the finals. And I know the meme is people are worried about seeing Mad Lions internationally again. But listen, they prove time and time again they deserve to be going there. This wasn't a close back-and-forth series. This was Mad Lions all day, every day across these three games. It, it has to be something where you can have your doubts. You could be disappointed and whatever type of thing, but there's no denying that these Mad Lions are crossing the check marks that they have to. They're making everything count to get these opportunities to go back to an international event. And it's one of those ones where, again, you can be of either a glass half full or glass half empty type of thing. You can look at it as that opportunity. This is the one where these Mad Lions are going to show up internationally. They are going to put that fight out there and show why they're qualifying for this event. Or you can be that glass half empty and go, oh, no, the Mad Lions, here it goes again. And I think the proper way to do it, at least for me, is that glass half full from what we have seen from them always looking for that optimistic side it must be all that na hopium copium and the side effects coming over yeah and niski brings some of that over with you know ah, on yes. cloud nine we we carry it over but uh listen we got to touch on how are you only going to play two games after three weeks you play two best of fives and you got to wait a full week why would you not get the losers bracket going at the same time i truly don't understand the scheduling here out of the lec there's definitely going to be people that have different opinions about G2, about Mad Lions that we just talked about. I don't think there's going to be many people with a different opinion about only rolling through those two games Saturday, Sunday. After waiting three weeks to get to this point, every other region is slamming through their playoffs, slamming through their gauntlets, having who they're sending the world's already set up and ready. Meanwhile, LEC, we're moving on to the next one. We can't even do the Thursday, Friday to get the four games and move on to the full next section of this uh, part of where we're at in the season. Crazy. Everybody else, they got Worlds all set up and ready, and they are watching, preparing, making a couple of notes, watching the LEC duke it out at this point. Uh, well, yeah, now you got all eyes on the LEC, probably from the major region saying, huh, maybe EU is not as good this year as we're accustomed to seeing in years past. So there's... Gonna be extra pressure maybe on these guys. Not that they're thinking about it like that, but. I, I think if you look at Chovy's notebook, looking on the G2 series, he's got a couple of big question marks about Caps' Nico and Watch what's going on. Watch out for little crud. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, this is gonna be something that, I, I don't know how it was decided upon at this type of point, but absolutely next time around, retweaking the LEC type of schedule. Certainly at the very end, the way things are closing out is going to be the big focus point for me on where we got to make some changes. Yeah, the season finals is the main thing they got to look at. But that is it today for League Unlock. Erica Mark here with you beautiful people. As always, thank you for watching. We'll catch you on that flippity flip.